We're going to go on through Eliezer uh, Melendez for story number three. Eliezer, this is a piece that is coming out of uh, CBS News uh, down here in Miami. It's uh, WFOR. And let me read the headline and read the first couple graphs. Then I'm going to watch you to comment. Here we go. Headline, Diaz de la Portilla and Gabella headed the runoff for Miami Commission. We just had the election, city commission election going on uh, down here in Miami uh, last week. We're recording this the second week in November. There was an election last week. And the election was going on because the sitting commissioner was actually suspended by the governor of the state of Florida, Ron DeSantis, because he was brought to a number of different charges having to do with, um, let's say, financial shenanigans. I don't want to get into too many details. But I'm not an expert in that. But that's the I believe it, the, the, the actual a... charge was money laundering. So there you go. <laughs> money laundering. There we go. Money yes. laundering. So so here we go with the first couple of graphs, uh, Heli, so then I want you to comment. Um, again, headline, uh, Diaz de la Portilla and Gabella headed the runoff for Miami's uh, Commission District 1. At first couple graphs, city of Miami voters went to the polls Tuesday and the city of Miami to decide suspended Commissioner Alex De La Portilla would keep his seat. De La Portilla was suspended after he was arrested on corruption charges, but is still running. Three men and one woman were vying to take his spot. When it was all said and done, De La Portilla did not get enough votes to win his seat, but he'll be headed to a runoff with Miguel um, Angel Gabella. I'm wondering, uh, Elie, sir, how does somebody who gets arrested... Now, granted, everybody is uh, innocent until proven guilty. They get arrested. They are suspended by the governor who comes from the same party as the commissioner who gets uh, arrested, is suspended, is removed, and election is held. And yet this person uh, it basically is in the final two runoff, which will be decided a couple of weeks from now. How, how does that happen in a place like Miami? And more importantly, what message does it say to the, um, the, the business community? So very simple. The turnout rate for this election was under 12%. It was 11.9%. That means over 88% of the people that are registered to vote, eligible to vote, many of them even got an absentee ballot in their mail, in mail, just chose not to vote. Why? When you ask people in the district who is there of the candidates that will keep their promises, they say nobody. Who's there that's going to listen to your concerns? Nobody. Who's there that's going to help, you know, the poor? And the people that are struggling, nobody, who, who cares? Nobody. So they voted for nobody, right? <laughs> that seems like a pretty good candidate if, 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 if they meet all those things. So, so they voted for nobody. And then that means that you have people that are able to use a significant amount of money. Yes, La Portilla had over $2 million between his campaign account and his political action committee. He, he got 1,437 votes. Do the math. That is over um, over fifteen hundred dollars a vote, right? He could he would have done better just going out there and telling everyone here, I'll give you a thousand bucks and and please <laughs> vote for me. So those numbers are astonishing, but that is the reality of where we are. Um, I know both those gentlemen in the runoff well. Like I mentioned at the beginning of the show, I ran in this district. I actually came in third in the same election in twenty nineteen. So it was. Yes, El Portilla first, like in this case, Gabella second, and I came in third by about um, 120 votes. Um, they got a lot less, the, you know, the total number of people that participated were a lot less than four years ago. So the public is just disappointed in not participating. And, you know, we'll see what happens. The reality is that one of them is going to get elected or is going, is going to, yeah, I mean, one of them is going to win this, this runoff with over 50%. Mathematically, it has to be that way because it's only two candidates. So if the SL Portilla gets reelected, it'll be quite interesting to see if the governor suspends him again. He still has the felony char charges that he's facing. He still has to go to criminal court for these charges. Um, I would think that the governor suspends him again, but he's definitely going to make an argument if he gets reelected. Look, the people voted for me in spite of having the charges. It's undemocratic for you to suspend me. And maybe he won't get suspended. Uh, if the LP, if uh, Gabella wins, then obviously Gabella will be the commissioner. So it'll be interesting to see what happens here. Um, definitely not a good look. It's not making Miami proud to have the situation. And, you know, and this is a question for the the whole roundtable. Um, you know, we, there's been a lot of talk about people moving to South Florida during the pandemic um, from California, from New York, from all around. Um, how can or how should they view? All of these issues related to commissioners. Keep in mind, one commissioner was sued and basically for using uh, planning and zoning, using investigators, using the police to go ahead and effectively 
that interrupt, let's call it, uh, businesses from operating because they didn't support that uh, that commissioner uh, 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 publicly. Then we had this situation where uh, the mayor of Miami is reportedly under investigation for trying to uh, push through a proposed project. And lo and behold, it, um, it, it was announced uh, that that the developer who had one of this project sort of pushed through uh, with paying about $10,000 a month, allegedly, to the mayor. And now we have uh, uh, Alex de la Portilla, who's been in the runoff. He was actually arrested. Uh, he runs for a runoff. So what's, what, what's the message that's being sent to the Californians and New Yorkers who've all moved down here? And how comfortable should they be um, setting up shop in South Florida, and especially in Miami, if this is the type of climate you got to operate in? Yeah, I mean, why why would you invest in Miami uh, when all this is going on? And I mean, the the um, the thing is, is you talk to any any uh, business owner uh, around the state outside of Miami, and you ask them, like. You know, do you have any business opportunities in Miami? Do you see Miami as uh, good territory to expand? And without without a doubt, I would say most of them would say they would never come to Miami and do business. Um, uh, on the other hand, we've had an influx of a lot of um, national financial services companies, uh, hedge funds and uh, technology companies and some very high caliber uh, new tenants and newcomers to Miami, and um, and um, I I think that they're going to demand uh, that the city cleans up its acts, yes. um, and I I I think actually that's the silver lining. Um, uh, while they they may sort of be tiptoeing into Miami, um, they're going to demand that uh, uh, you know the this this kind of um, this these kinds of shenanigans. Um, uh, at least, at least, um, uh, someone makes an effort to try to stamp some of these outs, um, before they make uh, more significant investments. But mm -hmm. I think those kinds of companies will want an atmosphere that is, um, you know, a whole lot less, um, uh, obviously, uh, corrupt than, than what we have now. So I think, I think things will improve, uh, especially with a lot of out of towners coming in and demanding that they do. Yeah. Sean makes, uh, it makes a great point. I mean, the New Yorkers and Californians who've come down here, they're out of the league. You would think that they're wised up and they're, in, you know, intelligent to understand this corruption, you know, in their own uh, backyards, but it's nothing like mine. I mean, or even Broward. I mean, we, we used to call, when I used to cover uh, um, investigations in, in Broward, we, we used to call it fraud Lauderdale because it was so well known, you know, at least within South Florida, as a, a corrupt place. Miami-Dade, of course, even worse. Palm Beach, you had a lot of mob, mob companies set up there in Boca Raton, you know, uh, some of the boiler rooms up there. So it was, it's really been a, a great place to cover crime, um, you know, uh, as, a, as a reporter. But I, I think Jean's right. I think they're going to really force them to clean up, especially if the companies that have moved here and are threatening to move out, you know, that, I mean, it's good leverage for them. They could just say, listen, we need to clean this up or we're out of here. I want to add one more thing. Like, yes, uh, like I said, DLP, uh, and so he's known as universally commissioner of the SLBT, raised $2 million from business interest, essentially, um, during the campaign. Now he's going to, on a runoff, he's going to start raising money again, right? When he was arrested, his fundraising dropped off precipitously. He went from raising almost $75,000 a week to in the last week or last week and a half before he, he was able to raise more money, he was able to raise only $12,000. But now he's got the second round. He got 39% of the vote in the first round, so he can definitely make some arguments to some people, hey, I'm going to win. You better support me. So I think the proof will be in the pudding in a week or so when we see if the people that stopped giving him after he got arrested gave him, a, gave him money again in the second round, see how serious these business um, entrepreneurs are about you know, not giving to corrupt folks. That's a great point. Great point.